Romans 13, verse 1, starting there, and I want to read through verse 7. Let every soul be subject to governing authorities. Now, you have to pay close attention to what I want to share with you tonight and close attention to what the Apostle Paul is writing here because it is many times misunderstood, and that's unfortunate. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. I'm going to explain that. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers, listen, are not a terror to good works. That is a huge key right there in understanding governing authorities in our world today. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but evil, but to evil. They are a terror to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have the praise of the same. For he is God's minister to you for what? Good. Everybody say good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, he says it again, an avenger to execute wrath on him who does what? Say it with me. Practices evil. That is a qualifier to God's authority that whom he has appointed. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also be for conscience, your own conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay what? All right, just being clear. For they are God's ministers. He says it again for the third time. Attending continually to this very thing, the things that we just read. Render, therefore, to all their dues, taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs, to whom customs, and fear, to whom fear, honor, to whom honor. Pray with me right now. I have a lot of explaining to do. All right. Father, thank you for your good word. We love your word. It is indeed a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And we treasure it and we bring it in. And we love exegeting your word in order to understand and comprehend your heart in its context and in its beauty and message. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. So uh, here's my question. Are governing authorities accountable to God? <laughs> I'm done. Drop the mic. No, no, no. There's a lot of explaining. And here's, here's the point. Now, as we know, you know, when, when we like a certain politician, you know, we think, they're from God. We think that other ones are not from God. But we have to be careful as to understand what the Word of God says and, what, and how God determines governing authorities. Which ones are legit and which ones are not. And so, we have to look at this important question. God desires, now let me qualify a few things and let me share a few things and in light and in the introduction of this, God desires 
that you and I live with a clear conscience. That's for sure. That's what we definitely read here. Among the citizens of our nation, right? And have a clear understanding, listen, that he is both, that God is both transcendent over the nations, yet absolutely imminent among the authorities of the nations. What do I mean by that? That he is sovereignly over, he is sovereign judge, and he is actively involved in those in the lives of those who are leaders of nations. They may not know him, they may not care to know him, but God knows them. And God is holding them accountable for how they treat the masses of people under their authority. And so again, let me ask you the question, are governing authorities accountable to God? And the answer is yes. And this is why. And this is, you won't read this in this passage, but I want to expound a revelation that is very clear in this passage. Yes, they are accountable to God if God has appointed them, if they are appointed by God, then they are most definitely accountable to God, whether they know it or not. How many understand what I just said? I got two people. How many under, I'll, I'll repeat it. So if they are appointed by God, then they are accountable to God. Does that make sense? Just like I am appointed by God and I am accountable to God. Whether they know it or not, they are accountable to God. Now, God will make himself known to them in many, many ways. He did, remember, he did to Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar, I believe, with the handwriting on the wall. You know, you're, you have been weighed in the balance. That very night his kingdom was taken from him. And so he is sovereignly over the nations, and he is imminently, and over the leaders of nations, and he is imminently involved and, and very much a part of holding leadership accountable in the nations. And so this is just not, as we know that it is, a passage on Christian conduct. This is indeed a passage on Christian conduct, how Christians are to live in an, in an unbelieving society and under governing authorities that may or may not be Christian, because when Paul was writing this, you know, there was the, the Romans and Caesar, they were not Christians, let's put it that way. But he's saying something to you and I as Christians and to the Christians at the time. But listen, let me read that again. Let me say that again. This is not just a passage on Christian conduct under governing authorities. It is a revelation about rulers and their appointment by God and their accountability to God. Let's make that very, very clear. And so let me, let me ask you this, and I shared this on, uh, on one of my posts today, just a simple post. Did you know that there are 195 nations in the world today? Did you know that? Okay, Cheryl knows that because she prays for nations. She prays. She intercedes for nations. She gets the detail, and she intercedes for nations. You should probably, and I should probably do more of that, right? We prayed for Russia this past week. We prayed for Ukraine. You know, we should be doing that for nations and list their, their leaders and pray over them. But do you see how easy this is for God, 195 nations? 195? We look at the world as so huge. So big. There's 195 nations. And those nations have a leader. And God knows every single one of them. So let's make that very clear, abundantly clear. And so the nations and how they are governed, let me say this, are very important to God. So important to God that He sits as judge over the nations. Now let me explain a little bit of background here. In the beginning, God gave mankind dominion over the earth, correct? He told mankind to subdue, 
to subdue the earth and make it produce the blessing he intended for mankind. That was his, that was his heart. He wanted mankind to subdue it and create the blessing, to manage the earth, right? And to, and to make it produce for the people that would be multiplied. And so, as mankind multiplied, nations of people were formed, kings and kingdoms rose. Until today, and all throughout history, we see this, kingdoms rising, kingdoms falling. We see this, we see it in the Bible, it's throughout uh, human history. And, and in much of that, and, and all of that, I might say, Almighty God is the judge in every single one of those cases. How do I know? Because he is over the nations. He, he judges the nations and he judges the kings of nations. Now, he judges in different ways, and, but ultimately there is the judgment that he meets out because he is almighty God. He is judged. He rules. He intervenes. And we see that on many, many occasions, occasions in the Bible. Daniel 2, 21 says he changes times and seasons, right? Winter, summer, fall, spring. And just like he does that, he deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. This is a very important part of the eternal and sovereign reign, rule, and dominion of Almighty God in the earth. You have to understand this as a Christian. You just can't be thinking, well, you know, we're on, you know, America's going to hell in a handbasket, not as long as I'm here and you're here. Somebody say amen. This isn't Sodom and Gomorrah yet. And we're here to and determined not to allow that to happen. Let me go on. I'm talking about how he rules and reigns in the nations. I'm, ta I'm talking about that he is, over the, he is sovereignly over the nations, and he is imminently and intimately involved in the leadership and judging of leaders in the nations and nations. Psalm 99 verse 1 says this, The Lord reigns. Everybody say, The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. Let who tremble? He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Hallelujah. Psalm 110 verse 6. This is so vital for you to understand. Who's our president? Joe Biden. Who's our legislators? This is so important. This should put your heart at ease concerning God's involvement, letting him do some things you and I cannot do. Somebody say amen. All right. Look at this. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm wishing any ill on anyone here when I read this because this is a pretty strong verse. At not in the least am I saying this. But this is a scripture in the Bible, Psalm 10, 1, uh, 110, verse 6. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. So this is, this is not trifling. This is not anything to trifle with. And I think God wants leaders of nations to understand. And obviously, he will work with people. He will send people into the lives of these leaders like he did Nebuchadnezzar, like he did uh, Belshazzar, his son. Who did he send? He sent Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel was an advisor, but uh, uh, Belshazzar never consulted with Daniel, even though his dad, Nebuchadnezzar, did. And so, how many understand when you run roughshod over the principles of God in leading a nation and you never consult God, you are doomed to failure. Doomed to failure. God will save the people, but as a leader, you are doomed to failure. How many understand what I'm saying? Have I lost anybody yet? All right. So Christ came, and, and by the way, this is the 4th of July week coming up, and I'm, I'm going to be teaching a little bit. I'm going to be referring to this, uh, this 
message tonight, so you're going to be way ahead of everybody on Sunday morning. And so Christ came, we know this. He came as a humble Savior. He came as a humble Savior of the world, right? Even though He was sovereign judge and King of kings over the nations. This is the beauty of Christ. I'll not go into all of that, but you understand. God the Father, let me say this, God the Father gave the nations to God the Son as His inheritance. Psalm 2, read Psalm 2. And He did this in eternity past, I would presume. You know, He just didn't, oh, the nations are here. Oh, I better give them to somebody. No. Come on, somebody. And so, God gave them to his son. And this is what it says at the end of Psalm 2, verse 10. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. He's speaking to kings and judges in this entire, he's speaking to nations in this entire psalm. Psalm. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Do we have Supreme Court justices? Do they rule? You better believe they rule. Has God's hand been in the Supreme Court justices that we have seen appointed recently? You better believe it. I'll not go into that one, but boy, did we see some things happen right there at the end of President Trump's president, his first term. It goes on to say, serve the Lord with fear. He's speaking to kings and judges. Serve the Lord how? With awe and reverence and rejoice, with trembling. Kiss the Son. Be affectionate. When you hear the name of Jesus, be affectionate. Be open. Be humble. Lest He be angry. See, He doesn't judge us like He judges the nations. There's a different judgment there. We are under the blood. Somebody say amen. And He saves people, convicts them. Ultimately, if they reject Him, yeah, they'll experience the judgment of God. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Somebody say amen. So he's speaking to kings and judges of nations here. And nations. Not only can Almighty God, who rules in the courts of heaven, we had a we had a great lesson uh, in our last Healing Rooms conference about the courts of heaven. Wow, was it good. Um, but not only is he ruling there uh, to raise up kings and authorities and rulers, he can also sovereignly dethrone them, right? Yes. We know that. So let me give you a few more examples. Remember Pharaoh in Egypt? Did he dethrone Pharaoh? I think so. What about Belshazzar, as I said, of the Chaldeans, right? King Saul, he dethroned him and brought in King David. Now, sometimes this process takes years. But, I mean, no, God is so gracious. He is so good. He wants people to repent. I mean, he doesn't want to just have to ha appear with a hand on, writing on the wall and just say, it's over, pal. You didn't listen to anything I said. Tonight it's done. Right? So the question is this. Is God still the almighty sovereign judge and ruler over the nations today? Yes. My dad is on fire tonight. Hallelujah. You better believe he is. I mean, he doesn't act, you know, as hastily as we would sometimes, but sometimes it's even quicker than we would. And so what does... Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, reveal about the rule and judgment of God in the nations and the reverence both leaders and citizens should have for Him and for His righteous judgment. It reveals a lot. Everybody say, it reveals a lot. That's the question we should be asking ourselves from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. So, in light of that passage, how do you feel about our nation? Amen. You don't have to answer. Just I want you to think about it. But I appreciate it. 
I love you, Dad. And I love our nation. You should love your nation. And I'm going to be preaching on that on Sunday. And so I want you to hear that. It doesn't mean we don't love God. It just means that we can do both. And we can, the Bible talks about in Jeremiah, seek the peace of the city where you are at. In other words, the city-state. Cities were basically countries at that time. And so anyway, and in light of this passage, how do you feel not only about our nation, but our nation's history? There's some real, real dark things about our nation's history. And how do, here's the questions. I'm just, I'm just, I just had a bunch of questions I wanted to read for you. How do you view the birth of this nation? The Revolutionary War. Remember that? How many learned about that in, in high school? In light of this passage, how do you feel about the 4th of July? It's next week, right? And so how do you feel about independence from Great Britain and King George III at the time? Were the 13 colonies rebelling against God's sovereign authority by going to arms against Great Britain? Don't say yes or no. I just want you to listen. Because these are very important questions when it comes to proper exegesis of the Scriptures and understanding God's view of governing authorities. And what about the Declaration of Independence? And the U.S. Constitution, were they written, here's a key question, were they written to throw off evil or to propagate evil? That is a question that we have to look at concerning our nation or any nation uh, in light of what God is saying in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. You didn't think God was this political, did you? You did not think God was this political. I know you did not. No, you did. Because I, I teach you better than that. How did, not political, he is the governor. He, he governs the nation. The government is upon his shoulders. Woo! All right, I'm getting excited here because I just get excited that he's sovereign. How do we, I'm, I'm still reading questions here about this and about our nation. How do we square our nation's uprising with this passage that is in the beginning of this nation, the Revolutionary War, uh, with this passage about how God wants Christians to live under governing authorities and how governing authorities are to rule people justly. And so I hope to clarify and answer these questions for you right now. Everybody say right now. But it's quarter after, Pastor Randy. Do you want me to break this up for next week? Or do you want to hear it now? All right. You, you, all right. All right. Are you on vacation? Everybody on vacation? You don't have to get up? All right. It may take a while. No, I'm just teasing. And so I want to give you some clarity, and I want to create a greater spiritual foundation in the matters of what? Your faith and your freedom. Your God and the governance of man. I want you to understand that. It'll give you greater peace. So let's look at the Revolutionary War. Let's look at how God deals with nations today. Let's look at what's happening in the nations today, in a sense, but certainly in light of uh, governing authorities, Christian conduct, and God's judgment on evil. That's the key. Because he makes it very clear, governing authorities are to execute judgment on evil. And if they don't, there could be some real problems uh, with God. And that's why I say, are governing authorities accountable to God? So let's look at this first. I'm going to give you three principles. Everybody say three principles. I'm going to try to run through them real quickly and we'll be done. Principle number one, rulers, according to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Rulers, and I'm just putting it in my language, rulers or governments must be inherently or fundamentally just and inherently good to just people. 
not evil and oppressive people. That is rule number one with God. And so if governments become oppressive to good people and good to evil people, they got a problem with God. And that's how nations are overthrown. Can I say that any more plainly? I don't think so. And so rulers are not, he says it, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And so if rulers are appointed by God, then therefore they are accountable to God. And if they don't practice this, then that accountability, God will certainly judge that nation. He will judge those leaders. And he will preserve the righteous. And he will do away with the wicked. That's just the way it rolls today. That's the way God does things, whether people like it or not. Now, he will give people space entire lifetimes to repent. But that doesn't mean he's not going to judge. He's not going to do what is right, especially among leaders. And so... Rulers are not a terror to good works, but evil. Why? So mainly, mainly so that the gospel can be preached in the nations. Amen? That's God's real agenda, by the way. It isn't just to execute judgment. You've got to do whatever I tell No, no, no. I mean, yeah, he wants them saved, but the fact is, is that he wants these nations and their laws to be a platform upon which the gospel can go forth freely and people can be saved and the harvest reap. Somebody say amen. amen. And so there's nothing more just than the gospel. There is nothing more good than the gospel. And so when we talk about the heart of God we are, we, and rulers and how they are to judge, this is the main, this is the main emphasis that he has. So the question is, is preaching good? Is preaching the gospel good? Yes. And so what if, what if a government or ruler bans the gospel, bans preaching, and if you or I or any missionary preach the gospel or start churches in a nation and there's rulers of nations where that is strictly forbidden, what happens? What is, what is the result of that? Well, if God tells you to preach in that nation, you should preach in that nation. And you will suffer persecution. Just like they did on the day of Pentecost. They came out, they preached. The Sanhedrin and the Roman armies and, and Herod didn't like it. And they jailed them and did all of that. Somebody say amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Have I lost you? You guys are ready to go to sleep. So what is the deal here? We are to live by a higher command if, those, if that is what the evil government, not the good government, that is an evil government that tries to stop the gospel, hinder people that are good, and throw them in jail. We live by a higher commandment, God's great commission. And yes, we will risk martyrdom, imprisonment, and all of that. I've already settled in my, in my heart that if this government of ours ever says you cannot preach the gospel, you cannot assemble, Pastor Randy will be here until they throw me into prison. I'm about ready to speak in tongues. And so this is what happened in Rome under Roman Caesar. What happened? They out, they, Caesar is God. You can't worship another God. You have to worship Caesar. And so they'd bring Christians in. They would interrogate them. No, I only have one God. That's Jesus. Well, you are going to be thrown to the lions. Then throw me to the lions. I would rather be thrown to the lions than to bow before you and say you are my God. Somebody shout. So this is how you square ruling governments. They have to be inherently good. They have to be just. If they are not, they are not appointed by God. And God will remove them and judge them. And he's done that in Christian history. I mean, he entirely flipped. He, ent he flipped Rome completely. After so many decades of Christians getting eaten by lions, you know, and, but 
Christianity grew. It flourished, right? And suddenly, oh, yeah, we're going to conquer in Jesus' name and, you know, all that. And I don't, I don't know about all of that, but that's beside the point. And so God will remove rulers who try to impede his plan in the nations. He will remove them. And I, don't, I can't tell you the time frame on that, but he will. He is judge over rulers of the nations. He is judge over them. And one day, he will judge the entire nations, and he will separate them, right? The sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And so he is weighing the actions and motives right now. He is weighing the actions and motives of every single ruler of these 95 nations, legislators, judges, whomever they are. He knows their heart and probably... Tens of thousands, I don't know, in these 195 nations. And he is weighing them in the balance of his justice in the courts of heaven. Only God can do that. And only God can do that justly. Daniel 2.21 says he changes times and seasons. I said it. I'm going to say it again. He deposes kings and raises others up. God can give and will at times. He will. I'm sorry. God can and will at times remove evil rulers violently and quickly or slowly and methodically. Acts chapter 12 tells us about King Herod. Remember his arrogance? You know, everybody was screaming how wonderful he was and you know, he, he had imprisoned Peter. He was trying to stop the gospel. He was trying to stand in the way. And what did, it's right there in the book of Acts. This is an Old Testament. This is New Testament. What happened? He tried to oppress and he tried violent action against Christians, against Peter. And guess what? The judge of the nations came and what did he do in Acts chapter 12? Anybody remember what happened? Smote him on the spot. Sent an angel. Smote him on the spot. It's pretty gruesome. And so right now, nations are being judged. Nations and people are being removed. And it may be that a more evil ruler is raised up because it's the people's responsibility to make sure good rulers rule. And if the people aren't willing to fight for their nation to elect good rulers, then guess what? Evil is going to prevail. And some of you have seen it in your nations. I talk to missionaries all the time. I talk to nationals all the time. The reason why evil rises up is because the people get oppressed and scared. You have to be willing to die for your freedom so that your children and grandchildren will have a better life. We have to be able to do that. We have to make that decision. No, I'm not going to live in this nation forever, but I trust that God loves the nations and wants me to fight in a good way, in a Christian way, right, for our nation. All right. What do we see in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46? We see the nations being judged by Jesus in the millennial reign. So he is judging nations, and we see that. Rulers, let me rehash, number one, principle number one, rulers or governments must be inherently just in God's sight and inherently good in God's sight to just and good people, not good to evil and oppressive people, or else God will judge those leaders. Is that clear? Number two, everybody say number two. I'm going to be quicker this time, I promise. Number two, rulers or governors, governments, rulers or governments must punish evildoers. According to Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, allowing good citizens and the nations to flourish. This is God's plan. Without fear of evil, to live in peace and prosperity. That is a principle of God. And people say, well, I don't want to get involved in politics. You have to fight for your nation in a good way. Not punch somebody. Knock them out. But pray and believe and get involved. Look at what he says. 
according to principle number two. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices what? Not good, but evil. Does that make sense? My dad thinks so. Come on, shake. I know it's getting long, but you got to. You. This is so important. I, people don't get. People don't understand why I'm so passionate. Not only about the kingdom of God, but about our nation. This is God's nation. I am a steward of my nation with God. I am a light. I am salt. You are light. You are salt. See, this is why God commands rulers to restrain lawlessness in their nation. If they do not restrain lawlessness, lawlessness takes over, and they're going to get run out, and the nation is going to be in chaos. Nations that permit lawlessness, and we've seen a lot of lawlessness in cities, guess what? Guess what happens when lawlessness prevails in a city? The city goes bankrupt. The city doesn't have any citizens. Nobody wants to live there. It will be a shell of what it used to be. Nations that permit lawlessness and evil to prevail are doomed to fail because God will see to that. You reap what you sow. Our nations, our nation, I should say, must be a nation of law, good laws, just laws. Somebody say amen. Amen. And order, because God is a God of order, under just laws. Leaders, good leaders, and good laws for the people every, of every ethnicity, of all nations, right? Because uh, America is a melting pot. So the people can flourish, so the gospel can be preached, so churches can be established. This is God's heart. People can be saved. Revival can break out. Hallelujah. The gospel can be preached. People can be discipled without fear of retribution. Rulers, let me rehash number two, and I'll get to number three. The rulers or governments must punish evildoers. If they're not doing that, you have a problem with God, and you can pray that way. God, show up. Hallelujah. Remove that leader. Remove that mayor that's just allowing all kinds of sin and gun violence in the streets. Remove them, God, so that we can have peace in our streets. Does that sound like a good prayer? I think it does. So rulers and governments must punish evildoers. That's a qualifier. Or they're not appointed by God. They're not a, was Hitler appointed by God? No, he was not appointed. What happened to Hitler? It wasn't a favorable ending, nor for the nation. And so... We can live without fear of evil. We must live. This is the way God wants human beings to live, to live without fear, to live without the fear of evil knocking down their door, to live in peace and prosperity, or else God will judge that ruler. He will judge that government. Number three. And I know these kind of sound the same, and I have them all in my notes. Rulers or governments must understand that their authority to rule justly and humanely comes from the sovereign God himself, creator God, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. For he is, that is, the governing ruler is God's minister. You can't be God's minister and be evil. God is not the minister of evil. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just emphasizing. He is God's minister to do to you for good. (laughs) Somebody say, does that make sense? That's why you have to hear what I'm telling you because many people don't understand it. Again, And so the answer is this. Rulers, whether they know it or not, are accountable to to the sovereign judge of the nations, Jesus Christ. They are accountable to him. And they will know it either now or later. And so the question about our nation, let me get back to that because I want to answer that. 
How do you feel about the Revolutionary War? What about the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution? Were they written to propagate evil or to throw off evil? Were the 13 colonies rebelling against God's governing authority? How do we square this uprising in light of this passage? Were they perfect people? Absolutely not. Did they do a lot of things? Nobody's perfect. And, and eventually we corrected a lot of problems as a nation, but it took us a hundred years. I mean, come on, people. We ran the risk of our nation crumbling at its very core because of the arrogance and evil people wanting to lord and put others in slavery and do critically evil things against others. Wow, did we ever run a risk as a nation. And I just want you to know how precarious our nation was in the balance during the Civil War and all of that. And so, was the Revolutionary War conducted to overthrow evil at the time? Was the Revolutionary War conducted to create a more godly and just government for people? Well, let me give you some answers there, and I'll close. Come on up here, Dave. I need a little background music, because this is heavy. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've never preached through this passage before, and so there you have it. But here's my answer. This is my humble This is just my humble feeling about it. In light of everything that I've taught you tonight, I feel the forming of our nation was not only worth fighting and dying for to establish and to establish a new government as we know it today. And as I said, yeah, it took a long time for people here with us, many millions of people, to experience that freedom. But thank God we got it right, finally. That being said, God knows the end from the beginning. But it was worth fighting and dying for to establish. It's worth fighting for and dying for now. For this government, that new government then, to throw off tyranny. Because I believe in God's foreknowledge, He knew this government would be a platform upon which the gospel would spread to the nations, that there would be a correction in the justice for all, and this nation would grow, and the gospel would be preached through it, and the gospel would grow exponentially for hundreds of years to the nations. God knew that, and so... I'm not saying everything they did was perfect, but listen to what I'm saying. They threw off tyranny, though they were terrorizing others. It's just, I can't, I don't know it all. I wish I did. God knew establishing, this is just my humble opinion, this new government would be a blessing to the nations eventually as freedom for people spread around the world in other nations. So can I read something to you on this close to 4th of July Wednesday? Can I read the Declaration of Independence in light of all of this? Not the whole Constitution, but just the Declaration of Independence. Remember, we're answering the question about King George and those who threw off his government. This is what it says. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth to separate an equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God, that is, God is the God of nature, Entitle them, this entitles them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impels them to that separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And this is a declaration that they made. 
that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Does that make sense? Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And according to all experience, ha hath shown that mankind are most disposed to suffer while evil, evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuse and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object in vices, I guess, a design to reduce them under absolute depotism, it is in their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. And you can go on and read it. And then they give a re they give reason they list their reasons why they are throwing off the the oppression of King George the Third. And so, what's the result? What is the result of this incredible thing that they did hundreds of years ago, about 150 years ago, 250 years ago? What is it? You and I sitting right here, right now. We are from every ethnicity. We are from every background. Somebody shout amen. Here we are in America living a free life. So, Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that, Lord, you would forgive us of any judgment that we've had about our nation and that you would teach us your heart for the nations and pray for our leaders regardless of who's in there because we know that you are sovereign over the nations and we know God that you know how to raise up leaders and you know how to remove leaders so for that we give you thanks and praise in Jesus mighty name and everyone said stand with me bring those lights down let's make this declaration to our Heavenly Father Say it after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you that I live in a nation where the gospel is free to be preached. Thank you that I can freely assemble with your people without fear of evil or reprisal. Thank you that I can speak freely and openly about what is evil in your sight in our land. Thank you that the leaders of our nations, of our nation, are accountable to you. Thank you that I am living in this day to be a light of your love of your forgiveness and your power to those held captive by evil and sin. I will live for you in such a way as to bring glory to you and justice 
to light in our nation. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Give God praise. Come on. Hallelujah.